And I'm like, what? What was that? Chirp! And it's, I mean, it is loud, but it's always in the middle of the night. Welcome to Fridays on the Fly, episode 15. I'm Eric. And I'm Ward. We're creative people with creative projects, and sometimes we even talk about them. Today, we're going to talk about tools and shops. So first things first, I was looking at, you know, I've had my ongoing YouTube project, and I was looking at how many people view my videos, which is very few. <laughs> wait, wait, which project in particular? The movie thing? I was looking at my vlogs and my movie reviews on YouTube. The movie reviews are averaging very few views, but I actually had somebody comment on one of the movie reviews. Really? I'd reviewed The Theory of Everything, the Stephen Hawking story, and one of my complaints was... I wish it showed more of his day-to-day life. That I felt like it just didn't make it personable enough. So somebody, I actually did watch it since since we talked about it last. But go, yeah, go ahead. So, so you're so one of the three, huh? <laughs> no, no, I actually watched the movie. Oh, really? It was on HBO, so I, yeah, yeah, I watched it. But I actually had somebody comment, and they said, you know, I had the same complaint, but the DVD actually has some deleted scenes. I was just amazed somebody actually watched my review and then took the time to Com- respond. Comment on it. I was like, thank Your you. Your mother? <laughs> no, it wasn't. My One of my vlogs, The Stranger Danger, which I guess was my first vlog. Now, I've had people tell me they've watched it, but YouTube stats say only two people watched it. It has to be more. Let's just assume those stats are right. Well, I've seen it. I know my mom watched it. So that's, that's true. That's at least two. Here's the thing. YouTube tells me two people watched it. One of those people disliked it. <laughs> Could have been me. <laughs> wait, wait. Which one was The Stranger Danger one? I believe that was the very first one where I met that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I didn't dislike that one. But YouTube stats tell me tells me that half the people that watch it are from the United States and half the people are from the UK. So I'm guessing somebody from the UK disliked my video. Americans. <laughs> and even better, it, the video is about four minutes long, and YouTube tells me that between the two of them, they average watching three minutes of it. So I'm like, you may not like it, but hey, you watched over watched, half of yeah. it. I was thinking about the the vlogs, and I think it's almost too early to start doing to start calling it a vlog. You know, you started out with movies. I think you got to find an audience somewhere else first and then get into the vlog. I've just started to, to watch more people's vlogs. And as I start to watch their vlogs, I go back into their history on YouTube. And they started out like with little movies like what you had. And they got popular that way. And then they started into the vlog. Oh, that's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. A lot of the vlogs like I, I see is that people, they have their main channel. Right. And they were successful enough to where now they have a spinoff vlog right. channel. You know, the thing is... I'm doing these vlogs in essence as a way to capture my memories. Right. I know. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're completely valid that most people that have vlogs are doing it to augment their main channel. But me, I see it as a medium to explore because you know, yeah. it is no, a medium, I, it is a medium no. of storytelling. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, would, it would be nice to be successful first and, <laughs> yeah. then, the vlogs. <laughs> and then do the vlogs. But that, that's a luxury I don't have right now. <laughs> I, I've been saving this up all week. Go ahead. So I met, he gave me his card. The card had his name and under it, it said Ernest T. Bass Imitator. What? Yeah. Do you know Ernest T. Bass? Of course. I had to look it up. You don't know who Ernest T. Bass is? Well, I did after I looked it up, but you know his car, his likeness is not perfect. I'm so not even from the south. <laughs> asked him, you know, what he did. I used to know him a while ago. It's been a long time. I asked him, well, who do you do now? He says, well, I'm an entertainer. Here's my card. When your card says your name and Ernest T. Bass imitator under it, you've made it. You've made it. <laughs> and it's got me thinking about I could do that. You know, I I've got different costumes. I could be a knight imitator, a two face imitator. So. I might take a card from his book and just print out a bunch of business cards and just have me different pictures and say whatever it is, imitator. If you want Two-Face at your party, please call me. <laughs> yeah. I think it would be $100 an hour plus travel and expenses. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I don't see you getting that. I don't really want to do it, though, so that's the beauty of it. <laughs> I can't believe you had to look up Ernest T. Bass. I did. You're from the South. That's like that's like a sin. Well, you know, if he's an Andy Griffith imitator, I would have gotten that one. It didn't say Andy wow. Griffith imitator. It said Ernest, Ernest T. The guy. So, did you look at you looked up who he was? Did you look up any like clips he was in or anything well, like I, that? After I looked him up, I'm like, oh, I knew him then. Oh, oh, so you're familiar with Andy Griffith? Oh, of and course. The guy yeah, I mean, I've seen Andy Griffith. I'm familiar with it. But, you know, I appreciate the guy said he's an, an imitator, not an impersonator. You know, it's a subtle distinction, but I like it. That is strange. I'm not impersonating. I'm just imitating him. <laughs> I mean, that's true, the fact that he doesn't look that much like him. What's the difference, though? Impersonator supposed to look like him? I feel like impersonator, you know, an Elvis impersonator, they should be indistinguishable. Right. If you're an imitator, maybe you're not quite making it. <laughs> so these, these cards weren't serious. It seems serious to me. I mean, <laughs> the, the guy's an odd fellow, but uh, I would take it serious. And I'll, actually, he had a little website on the back, and he's part of a group of Andy Griffith and I don't know if they're impersonators or imitators. I can't remember what Beck said, but he's part of a group that this is what they do. So I feel like being the group, you must be taking it pretty seriously. Wow. There's something out there for everybody. Apparently. <laughs> so I've got another one. Go ahead. Did you see, we've talked about Banksy before. 
Yeah. Did you see his theme park that opened up the past couple of weeks? Dismaland. Dismaland, yeah. Some of it I got right away, and some of it I really wasn't sure what he was referencing. I'm not sure everything was a reference. Oh, yeah. I think everything referenced Disney. What was amazing is if he would have just called it Disneyland, I would have lost it. Would you have sued him? <laughs> <laughs> no, because he probably spelled it B-I-Z, which we should have done. True. Disneyland. That would have made more sense. <laughs> really? Especially with the logo and the smoke. Right. Well, wow. the, yeah, yeah, the biz. The business, business part of yeah. it. Right. I don't know why we didn't think of it. So what do you, what, what do you think about it? I think it's really neat. At the same time, regardless of what he was making fun of, what he was satirizing, when you put that amount of time into something, it's going to do well. I mean, there's a ton of detail all over. Banksy alone, his name will generate interest. The general public does not know who he is. What does he do all day? Do you think he's a banker? That's why they just call him Banksy. Because you've got to have a ton of time to come up with this stuff. Dude, I know he has an army of people that probably help him, but how is he making income? How is this happening? Wait, what were we talking about before we before we started recording? We're talking about uh, the 360 camera. We both follow Casey Neistat's vlog. I don't watch it every day, but I do catch up on it. Keep, you know, I'm up to date. One, he did this 360 camera review, which I think, who put, who put out the camera? Rico. I was amazed by the technology. You said that you watched it on your laptop. Were you able to scroll yeah. through? Yeah. How did you do it? With your arrows? Or no, you have a touch? In the, in the corner of the video, oh. there's a little toggle button, so you just click the mouse and it clicks gotcha. up down. That was incredible. Take a typical video. You're seeing one set of frames... You know, 24, 30 per second. Break it down to a cube, six sides of a cube. That's six times the amount of information. But this video goes through each frame seamless. So I can, in essence, watch that video six to eight times and, and see, see pixels new. completely new that I haven't seen before. Not only to capture all that imagery, but to scroll through it seamlessly as you watch the video. I mean, I watched the video and it was seamless. I went all the way around, all over. So I watched it. This thing is amazing. I didn't think that the um, that the quality of the video that it captured was that great. As I watched it a little bit more and I watched it again, I thought, what would you use this for? Law enforcement, don't they use you know, sensors similar to that when they're like bugging rooms? I mean, at least on TV. Well, yeah, I mean, but, but what would you use this for in your, in your daily life? Me being in architecture and engineering, if I'm going to an existing building where I need to like get a really good image of everything in the room. Perfect for that. As a tool, yes. I completely agree as a tool. But as a consumer who has that as a camera, I just don't see the use for it. I see you using it a couple times and like a GoPro almost where you're like fascinated by it at first, but then afterwards kind of like, okay, that's what it does. It's a novelty. I mean, it'd be neat for any kind of business. If I want to virtually look at a video of their store, it's good for that. But a regular consumer. What, what? I mean, I can see maybe like businesses, law enforcement, you know, like. Completely agree. You have that thing on the front of your car or you hold it or whatever. I mean, whatever. Yeah, I just don't see it. You know. I'm wondering if you could film it without seeing the crew because essentially that, that thing is the crew. Well, yeah, but you have a person with lines. You have the person holding the mic and sound. And if you just did it, you know, if you just. Oh, so you're saying a crappy movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when I think of like Slacker, I don't think Slacker's a crappy movie. But it was shot in essentially one take. I can't see a lot of crew. There would have been some crew, though. There always has to be some crew. Yeah, I guess. I, just... I mean, we try to make videos ourselves, just us. And I'm like, man, I wish we had one or two extra people. <laughs> this tripod's not doing its job. <laughs> tripod, I told you to cut. Why can't you cut? <laughs> Project updates? Sure. I've got none. <laughs> <laughs> That's quick. We talked previously about our interactive banner on some of the social media sites, where we have gotten likes on a few different sites, and I've updated it. So that is progressing, and... You know, little details are added. I haven't got any comments. Nobody said, oh, I see you added this or that. You know, one day I think it's going to take off. I think you should really add something extremely controversial and just see, see if anyone notices. You have to. You've got to have, like, cops beating on someone. <laughs> something, <laughs> just anything. I mean, or add some of, like, the public art things that we've talked about in there. Put a big Google pin right <laughs> on the corner. That would be good. I like yeah. that. Is it always going to be, like, that same street corner? Yeah, that's the plan. Oh, man. And I, I just keep. Bet you're going to run out of real estate there quickly. Well, see, the plan is, though, like some of those buildings are run down. So I right. plan to, you know, one image may be this building on fire. So then I can put a newer, bigger, better building there. Eventually, it's going to be so dense that any square you look at, there's going to be something happening that something. Because right now, there's a lot of dead space. A few weeks ago, we realized that my house doesn't have a lot of smoke detectors, and they're kind of nice to have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're just an inconvenience. I usually just end up unplugging them. <laughs> yeah, what prompted it? My wife was like, hey, you should check the smoke detectors. And they didn't work. And we realized that they were unplugged. So I plugged them back up. And an hour later, they start beeping uncontrollably. So that's why they were unplugged. So we did. We replaced them all. We bought, I think we bought 16 smoke detectors. So we'd have one for every room. And of course, this led to, in the living room, 
I try and find the best place to put it. And I've been trying to center them in the room, either on the wall or on the ceiling. And in my living room, I have a fireplace and there's a doorway. So there's not a good place on the wall. So I was going to put it in the ceiling, but in the center of the room was a light. My wife's thought was, we'll just put it off center. And of course, me being me, I never leave it teasing enough. Because we've talked about since we moved into the house that the living room is kind of dark because it's a very big room with one very small light. We know we could just throw this thing up there really quick. Let's make the room the way we want to do it. Let's take the light down and put up two lights. So if putting up a smoke detector that should take me two minutes turn into me pulling down the ceiling fan and installing two new ceiling fans. And of course, from that, you know, I mean, you're getting into junction boxes. Oh, of course. You did all that yourself? Oh, yeah. No, I can replace all that stuff, but I'm not there, I'm not adding. There's nothing being added. I will replace it, put new stuff up, but moving it, forget it. I think the awesome thing is my attic is small and it has that like blown insulation. So it's just this insulation dust everywhere. And you know, you're squatting down on your knees trying to, but, you know, I went up there, cut off where it hit the light, junction box, split it both ways. So I've got two ceiling fans in the living room now, two sets of lights, and it's amazing. I could just let slide and thought, oh, I'll worry about that later. <laughs> but I had to word it up. In the end, I got something I'm much happier with. And that's something I always do with any project. I think, you know, yeah, I could do this now and it could save me time now, but it's just going to cost me time later. Did you get the kind of the smoke detectors that hook into like the electrical of the house? Or did you get some that were just like battery? battery? Oh, okay. Right. I mean, hooking all of those in, that's a yeah, big that's, deal. Yeah, that's a, that's, and it's that's nice, a big job. We're pretty safe now. But man, when those batteries die... That's going to be a crazy week. Oh, my gosh. It's always about 3 a.m. Chirp! I'm like, what What was that? Chirp! And it's, I mean, it is loud, but it's always in the middle of the night. Well, now with 16, it's, all right, which one is it? <laughs> oh, I do the same thing. So I think pretty much when one goes, we'll just replace the batteries in all of them to just save ourselves the hassle. <laughs> all of mine are plugged into the house and they have a battery in them. So then it'll start to beep. I will take it down. I will unplug it. And it still beeps. I will take the battery out of it, and it will still beep. How's that happening? They just Those detectors don't want you to die. <laughs> <laughs> then I have to end up putting it in a drawer covered in clothing until the morning. <laughs> My dagger that I showed you the disparate pieces a yeah. couple weeks ago, that is together in one piece. I painted it today. Wow. Now that I've painted them, I have to sand it down and smooth it up a little bit. Soon, I'm hoping I can mold it and create more. And this is all for Halloween. All for Halloween. Yeah, I think we, we talked through our Halloween costumes today, and the children don't realize it, but they're all going as the greater good. The greater good? What's that? The greater good. It's for the greater good, Danny. <laughs> We're all going as black hooded figures with blacked out faces. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> Carrying weapons. So it. we started making the weapons today. They have no idea what it's from. I was like, here's a really good idea. Bought these white masks and these white hoods with you know the long robes and... We're working on uh, weapons. You and the kids all are going to be the great. The awesome. greater good. That is excellent. The NWA. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if anybody get that. If we put NWA on the back of the robe. No. <laughs> if they just think it They'll was. No, no, NWA. They won't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Straight out of Compton. Yeah, man. That's a good movie. <laughs> Somebody's got to get it somewhere. I mean, I'm very familiar with the movie, and I'm not sure I'd get it right off. But the, I, I really want to frighten some children. I want to see scared children. <laughs> that should that do should it. work. <laughs> Four black hooded figures. I thought about painting that instead of doing all black, because they were all blacked out. I thought about either leaving them white or just painting some black on the white in different scary faces. And the weapons we're going to make. We started out with a wiffle ball bat and put some nails through it. Duct taped it with black duct tape. So I mean, it just looks so menacing. Awesome. <laughs> we're going to be the hit at our church. <laughs> well, I'd say so. Speaking of menacing figures, did you see my short story blog post this past Friday and the accompanying picture? Which one was that one? Yep. You, you're posting so much. I, I am. Every time my phone makes the noise for Google, I know it's you. You know, I had a short story prompt. The idea I came up with dictated that the picture was me dressed up as a tiger and a parrot, one holding a bat and one holding a two by four with nails in the end of it. <laughs> He's got a board with nails in it. <laughs> yeah, I thought, you know, if that doesn't make people click it, nothing will. <laughs> No, I didn't see that. I don't know how I missed that. I've kind of settled on my vlogs will come out every Wednesday. My vlog will, uh, you know, cover that day. Okay. Did you have a vlog last Wednesday? Yeah. Which one was it? Never too old. Never too old. I thought of a great spoof for it. <laughs> my first vlog would be, sometimes you're too old. <laughs> and it would be an old lady at the top of the same slide saying, don't push me down. <laughs> she goes down the slide, follows the same path and breaks her hip at the bottom. <laughs> and then, sometimes you're too old. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I, we got to do it. I think you found your vlog. Your vlog me spoofing my vlog. <laughs> that 
that was a good vlog. I remember not liking the music. I thought the music, I was like, this isn't, this isn't you. Just seemed not you. But I thought the thing was good. And that was over at Osborne too, I think, wasn't oh, yeah, it? it yeah, it was. Yeah, the vlogs are kind of funny because at first I thought, how am I going to do a vlog at all? And now I've got something every week. I have my camera nearby all the time. And usually the course of three days, I'll just get enough footage that kind of relates that this to me is a theme and I throw it up. Oh, do you set out for the theme before you start the vlog or do no, you no. just, you just I, film and hope a theme emerges? With this one last week. My son and I, we were playing with Nerf guns. I was like, this will be good to capture. So I captured it. We were out on a playground. I'm like, okay, playground, Nerf guns. And then we went to Osborne. I'm like, now all this works together. So yeah, I don't try to come up with anything. I just shoot. And once I have enough footage in my mind to make a vlog, I put it together. And so I have some things that I just have sitting because they haven't really worked with anything. I thought about doing the same thing, just filming. And I have. I have filmed a bunch of things already. I just don't know what to do with them. I don't know what to do. Uh, you know, you just keep shooting. You know, I'm somewhat self-conscious. Doing this has made me less, less self-conscious. Because my wife is like, you're not going to take the camera into Red Robin, are you? I'm like, yeah, I got to. She's like, people are going to think you're silly. I'm like, people already think I'm silly. <laughs> yeah, so you know, if you want to become less self-conscious, carry a camera and film everything. Because you know, either you don't film it and you just don't get the footage. People don't look at me weird. I have nobody spat at me. Nobody's thrown food at me. <laughs> and I was in a restaurant. So I feel like, you know, who cares? Sometimes I'll see something and I'll go, oh, I really, I should really film that. By the time I like get everything together, I'm like, eh, I got to go to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> That's the hardest thing. Like I was driving on business 29 and there was a train and it had an open box car. I wanted to just take a picture of it, post it and say, you know, who wants to hop on with me? Bucket list. Cause I've talked to you about that before. I want to do a hobo thing, but uh, I just was like, Oh gosh, I got to get the camera. I don't have the camera on me. And then I, you know, by the time I got everything together, I was like, nah, skip it. I got stuff to do. That's why I try to keep the camera with me all the time. Between my camera, and my phone, Usually I capture stuff, but then there's still times like, ah, oh, you know, I should have filmed that. That could have been something. And you're doing it with your big video camera. Yeah, that on my phone. And all my videos are edited with Lightworks. You can get it for free. Right. It's it's a weird program, but it's an editing program. A lot of feature films have been done with it. I think all of, nearly all of Quentin Tarantino's films have been you done with Lightworks. You get it for free? Well, they changed their model. Your big ones are Final Cut, Avid, and I think whatever Sony makes. So they changed their game up to where they give you kind of this base model for free. You couldn't do a feature length movie with it. You need to get the paid version. Right. And I went ahead and bought it. How much was it? They have a very weird system. It's, you can buy it for a month for like eight bucks. You can buy it for a year for, what does that translate into? Like a hundred bucks. Or you can get like a lifetime, which lifetime means you can download onto a computer twice, which isn't really lifetime. No. They had some half price deal. So I think I got it for like one or 150. But what I didn't like was that when I originally had the free program, you could edit HD video and output HD video. Every couple months, they keep taking away features and like, oh, well, you have to pay to get this. It's like last month, it was free. So it's kind of shady. It's cheaper than any other editing program. I already know it. So I just went ahead and bought it so I could do everything I wanted to with it. I like it. It's a very nice editing program. Is that what you use to edit? Everything. I guess it was 2011 when I started making my short films religiously for eight months. The first issue was a camera. My wife was pregnant. I'm like, hey, we need a video camera for our son. <laughs> Baby on the way. <laughs> so step one was done. Then the second part was editing. And because you know, I was in school, I had access to their programs. Right. So I looked around, I found Lightworks and it was free and it's, oh, it's been used to make The Departed and all these Quentin Tarantino movies and all these movies. I'm like, that's free. Okay. Well, that's better than what I've got. I've got nothing. So I guess their program worked on, or their model worked on me because, you know, after five years, I finally bought it. <laughs> after five years. You've come a long way with like the camera stuff, the camera equipment. Did you start with anything before your video camera? Started with a video camera. And the very first video I did, the, my lighting was like a shop work light type thing. <laughs> so yeah, I just slowly get more and more stuff. I mean, it's kind of like this podcast. We started with that same video camera. <laughs> then we got an audio recorder. Now we have mics. So. Before that video camera that you got in 2011, that yeah. was it. did you have any other cameras before that? Not, I didn't make anything before then. You know, when I was in college, took a video making class in college. They gave me a camera. They gave me access to, um, it would have to have been Final Cut. That ended... I, mean, I didn't have money for a camera for any of that. 2005 to 2011, between that time, I was just wishing I had that stuff. And I finally got it. I'm like, all right, I'm going to make a short film a month in 2011. And I did that January through August. And then in each month, my videos kind of got bigger and more elaborate to eventually I just you know, couldn't fit all in there. I made eight January through August, which is not bad. No, not bad at all. Sadly, I don't think I've made many since then. No. <laughs> when it's been like, what, four years? So, well, you did the, you've done the vlogs, you've done a bunch of other things. Yeah, the I vlogs mean, are so easy. I mean, making a actual short film with scenes and it's tougher. The vlogs, they're pretty easy. I mean, they don't take me a ton well, of Well, what's easy about it is it's just, it's just you and a camera. And there's no editing. You know, it's just the only editing is, okay, cut this. I don't want that. You know, in a short film, it's like, okay, I got to make these scenes sync. All right. Which take is the best? 
in a vlog, there are no multiple takes. There's one take and it is what it is. Either it's good or it's not. After Halloween, my plan is I've got a lot of ideas, things I want to make. And some of these are things I thought, well, I just, I don't have the resources to make them. I can't do it. I'd like to, but I can't do it right. And now my prevailing thought is I can't do it the way I want to, but I'm going to get as close as I can. Because if I don't make it, it's dead. And we've talked about some commercials that I definitely want to do, but I decided that I've got to wait until after October because right now I'm concerned about finishing for Halloween. I've got some big plans. and I still have two months, right? I do, but that's scary. <laughs> there, there's a lot to do in two months. That's why I went really simple this this time. I was like, oh, it's already September. Yeah, but see, Halloween is always my, my excuse to like learn a new skill or do something I've never done. One year I learned how to sew and I've never made molds and plastic. And yeah, I don't know anything about that. I'm learning this time. So it's always my excuse to do something cool. Last year I made a proton pack. And that'll be so cool when Aiden gets old enough to like help out and want to do that stuff. I love that they want to help out with their costumes. When I was telling Jennifer in school, when I was a kid, I didn't know anything about making videos or any of this stuff. Aiden and I, we've made a podcast. We've made a vlog together. I'm not posting that stuff because that's that's our stuff. You know, he's in school. He's going to have these opportunities to do things really cool that other kids just don't have the equipment to do. You know, I'll be his technical resource, but I don't want to do it for him because what benefit is there to him or me? Well, I think him watching you will eventually mold the way that he does things. The fact is he may not want to do any videos. That may not be his thing. But he's going to have an opportunity, and that's going to be an opportunity that not a lot of kids have to yeah. do that. Exactly right. I, I, yeah, I it's no benefit agree. to me. I don't want to. I want him to do it, him to learn. The hardest thing is, is like when they're doing something, especially like a school project or something like that, to not step in a little, I, even more than a little. Because I've caught myself doing it like, oh, you know, you, if you cut it this way or you did this or, you know, use this to do, you know, it's very hard not to, not to, not to jump in. I have that now, you know, when he's just playing or doing things, I'm like, oh, you could, uh, no, yeah. you just do, right. do it your way. I'm like, yeah. you know, because that's his vision. I, you know, I don't want to mess with his artistic vision. And Yeah, but I mean, sometimes, well, sometimes you have to, you have to coach them. I try to leave it to if he's having a problem with it. You know, I don't try to redirect him. If he has a problem, he's like, well, I don't know how to do this. Help me with this. I help. I try to stay as hands off as I can. But if you get back to his podcast, he's very into Minecraft right now. Oh, who isn't? I've played with him. It's a lot of fun. You know, he watches the YouTube videos. He does these things. So his his podcast he wanted to do, he came to me. He wanted to do a podcast. He knows I did one. He wanted to do one on Minecraft. So it, it was funny. I love Steve. Yeah. <laughs> and the creepers. Yeah, that's Minecraft thing is crazy. I can't even keep up with it. I saw one of my kids playing it and they were playing something called like life. You can play with people global and people are talking on it and nobody's talking to any of my kids and my kids are not talking, but you'll see things on there that, that say from a player, how old are you? I was like, all right, time to get that off. Yeah. We don't play online. Well, normally they just play within their own worlds. No, he and I, we have a lot of fun with it. We were playing with dynamite and just blowing up an entire landscape, which is quite fun. And then somehow... <laughs> It's amazing how much he knows. I mean, he's he's four, but he picks this stuff up. Like, he had made this wall of lava, just like floating air. I'm like, how'd you do that? He's like, oh, you just do this, this, this. I'm like, we create this huge wall of lava across the countryside because, you know, how awesome is that? Why yeah. not? Son, this is separating the U.S. from Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> that game's crazy. I can't get into it. I've tried it. I just, I just don't really, I don't like it. I did think about, for Halloween first, doing Minecraft characters that have been killed. Like, with those <laughs> Minecraft swords, like, through their heads and stuff. <laughs> I thought, oh gosh, that's going to take so much time. And plus, there's going to be a million people out there dressed as Minecraft characters, but not as morbid as we would make it. Zombie Minecraft characters with like knives stuck in their necks still walking around. <laughs> but that's a lot of work. It is a little bit of work. Yeah. I think it's time for the main topic. So, all right, well, let's get right into the shop thing then. I've thought about it a lot. Like I said, we both kind of have shops. We have, We do different things. I do mostly automotive. You do props and wood and... What are the tools that you consider a necessity and what quality tool are you buying? Where are you spending your money? That's that's the most important thing because tools are expensive. So where are you spending your money? Where do you skimp? Well, right now I'd say my favorite tool is one I just got. Got it from my father-in-law. It's a bandsaw. And that's one of those things that I didn't know I needed it, but now that I have it, it's kind of the center of my shop. But they're incredibly expensive if you want to buy a new one. Definitely. And I know that they come in levels like most tools. Like maybe you get one for like 500 bucks, maybe you get one for three grand. Where does yours fall? The one I have is 30 years old. It's a, you know, a Sears Craftsman. So it's probably better than a lot of what's out there. But when I got it, it was handed to me and I was told, I don't know what's wrong with it. I don't know if it works. Here you go. I didn't know I needed a bandsaw. So at first I looked at, well, how is this going to help me? What use is this to me? And after my research, I'm like, okay, whether this works or not, I have to have a bandsaw. This is leading me to, you need to do a video on your shop, a shop video. Follow you around with a camera. 
Well, did you see my blog post about different tools and the best tools? And I didn't read it, but I did see the title come up. That's probably getting into a little bit of the video. I mean, the video is kind of the next step. A lot of my blogs, me formulating a thought and some of the stuff I'm thinking about, well, you know, I'd like to make a video that on that. That can lead somewhere, yeah. It's kind of like, this is the start. This is a rough draft. And then once I fine tune it for a video, shot video would be great. The bandsaw, I love it. For the stuff that you do, do you use a lot of hand tools? And what are you, what are you using there? Hand tools typically get into, if it's too small, when it's small stuff that I don't right. feel comfortable. So I'm a little, I'm a little more uh, wary of, hey, my fingers are too close to the blade. Cut a <laughs> finger off and that'll do it to you. So wait, wait, let's get into that story. So what was it, about two years ago, maybe? Four. Those of you that don't know, Ward had a shop mishap. Is that putting it lightly? Yeah, that, that sums it up well. You want to talk about the shop mishap? Let's start with the story because the story is actually kind of funny. My, my train of thought that got me to... um. The extent of my injury is I technically cut off one finger. I went to two different hospitals because the first one didn't have the resources to fix me. And it took them about six hours to figure that out. Uh. But they told me, you're going to lose three fingers. Then when I went to the second hospital, they actually had a surgeon who specializes in this. He said, you're going to lose two fingers. Guess what? Only, I didn't lose any. They, the one they were concerned about, really concerned about, they were able to reattach. Wow. So I still have all my fingers. One is a quarter inch shorter, but... Hey, you know what, what it could have been? The first hospital told me I'd lose three fingers. So anyway, Black Friday 2011. Right. My wife goes up to visit her family. They're a few hours away. She's going to shop with them. I have no interest in shopping on Black Friday. So I'm home alone. I think, all right, what am I going to do today? I need to clean the gutters. I thought, no, I should not clean the gutters because I'm home alone. If I fell off the roof, nobody would be here to get me. <laughs> I wouldn't want to get hurt when no one's here. <laughs> exactly. That is my train of thought. So the go so next thought is, hey, I'll use the table saw. <laughs> I'm going to use the busiest tool in my shop. I started building a mantle for my fireplace. You know, wood surround, columns, big uh, mantle. Been working on it for a couple of months. And I started that morning, probably around 8 o'clock, just cutting boards, doing all kinds of different things. About 11 o'clock, I took a break, had a snack, had an apple, and I went back to it. And I'm feeding a board through there. And it's about a one-inch watch, so it's kind of small. And I had a push stick, you know, I was trying to be safe. And so the board kind of jumps. I cut this off immediately. I'm like, man, if this messed up my board... This saw, man, I'm done with this saw. And so I look at my board. My board is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. So I'm like, oh, it must have nicked my push stick. Look at my push stick. It's got a little nick in it. I'd hold my hand like this. I didn't even realize it. And I happened to look down at my hand. And at that time, I didn't realize how bad it was. But I could see the where your my ring finger, fingernail meets the cuticle. I could see a big gap there. That was all I saw. I actually hit all four fingers on my left hand. That was the hand holding the push stick. Hit all four of them. And so I just saw the ring finger. I didn't know how bad it was, but I knew I was going to be going to the emergency room. So you nicked this like on the top of the blade. I was yeah, holding you hit the push stick, the blade. and it, the, it just kind of jumped, and my hand went forward. Which another thing is, don't push too hard with your push stick. Another valuable lesson I learned. You're supposed that to let the saw do its work. Now I know that. So yeah, you would have had you would have been holding it up, and you would have hit the top of the the front slash top. Right, right. My my table saw does not have a guard on it. Some of them come with guards. Right. Many of them come with guards. <laughs> this one was used. I got it used. It didn't come with a guard. Didn't really know it. It's supposed to have a guard. But uh, hey, way back when, when it was new, it had a guard. So you didn't even like have a piece of board clamped down as a guard? I had a fence. Oh, okay. But you know, a guard that actually covers the Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Blade. The blade. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, I had a fence. I had a push stick. The nice thing is, you know, I'm right-handed. I don't know why I wasn't holding the push stick with my right hand, but I'm very <sighs> glad I was using my left hand. My gosh. Maybe that's why it happened. I should have been using the right hand. Who knows? So, okay. All right. You cut your hand. You didn't know that it cut your hand right away. You didn't feel any pain. I looked at my board I was cutting. I looked at my push stick. I'm like, well, what, what did it get? You know, I had no idea. And I just happened to look down. It was probably... Were you wearing gloves? No. Nah, it was probably three or four hours later until I had the first hand of pain. When you cut yourself that bad, you cut through all the nerves and everything. Your nerves would have feeling. Right. You cut through those... You don't feel you're anything. Good. So was there anything laying on the table, any part of your body laying on the table that was not attached to you anymore? No. You know, it happened so quick. And, you know, I was holding my hand, palm up like this, you know, right. palm up, fingers, fingers you know, into clenched, a fist. Right. I later learned, the nurse told me that the only thing holding my ring finger on was a little flap of skin all the way through the bone, all through everything, just a little flap of skin. And actually, when you cut the top, all your tendons connect to the top. So if you had looked at my finger, that last knuckle... Each finger was bent 90 degrees down. Oh. And I didn't see any of this because I knew that if I look at this, look I'm going to freak out. Yeah. Panic. This happens. I see the ring finger. I realize I'm going to the hospital. I cut the light out to my shop, shut the door. 
go upstairs. I'm like, all right, I need to get my wallet. So I have my insurance card for the hospital. I get the dog. He's in the house. I put him out, give him food and water because I know I'm not going to be back soon. And I like the door. And as I'm doing all this, I'm thinking, okay, do I call 911? Do I need an ambulance to get me to the hospital? Do I call my parents? Well, no, they live 20 minutes away. And there's no reason to panic them. I know I need to call somebody. I realize my wife is a few hours away. Right. And I think, well, can I call one of my neighbors? And it's like, well, the ones I know best, they're closest. You know, by the time they get ready, I'm kind of doing the math of what's going to get me to the hospital the quickest. And this may have been the wrong decision, but I'm like, well, I'll drive myself. That'll get me to the hospital the quickest. I'll drive my myself. My right hand still works. Yeah. <laughs> and drive to the hospital. And I drive the speed limit because I'm like, well, I don't want to get pulled over by cops. So that's going to take longer trying to maximize. So I get to the hospital. I find the visitor parking. I, you know, like I pull up to the emergency <laughs> room. I pull up to the visitor parking. I walk briskly to the emergency room. And I say, hi, I've had an accident with a table saw. And she's like, well, how bad is it? You tell me. I'm like, I haven't looked at it. <laughs> I never sat down in the waiting room. I feel like I blinked and all of a sudden I was in a wheelchair. <laughs> oh my gosh. You never looked at it when they were working on it or anything. When's the first time you looked at it? I'll tell you when I realized how bad it was. They told me I was doing x-rays. I did a lot of x-rays. They told me to spread my fingers as wide as I could. And I kept feeling my ring finger poke my middle finger on the side, like right at the knuckle. My fingers are spread as wide as I can. They shouldn't be touching. I'm like, that's bad. (laughs) And I still hadn't looked at it. And what's funny to me is that I got to the hospital about 1130. I had my hand like this. They didn't wrap it up. Nobody did anything really other than looking at x-rays until about two or three o'clock when they shipped me to Greensboro. Hey, why, why did nobody wrap this up, you know, three or four hours ago? The hospital was incredibly nice. I've been to the local hospitals, both of them, and they are incredibly nice people. It's just not the place I go to in case of emergency anymore. (laughs) Drive to Greensboro. Yeah, you know, they're trying to like figure out like, okay, we think we can work on a couple of your fingers, but we can't we can't work on this one. So we're talking with Greensboro. We're gonna see, we're gonna figure out how we divvy up the work. And so finally Greensboro just tells them, look, we'll just do everything. You just wrap him up, you get him down here. It's funny, they had a brand new ambulance. I think I was like the first person to ride their brand new ambulance that day. <laughs> every every time a nurse or somebody new comes up to me, they're like, What happened? Table saw. Ooh. <laughs> every every single time. What Don't fix it. Table saw. Ooh. Ooh. Same grimace every time. Uh. So I finally had surgery. Cut myself about 11, 1130. Finally had surgery, 7 o'clock that night. Surgery took two hours. At what point did you notify Jennifer? So to back up, when I was leaving the house, I'm like, okay, I need to tell somebody where I'm going to be. So I called my mom. And you know, after years of telling my mom crazy stories when I call her, <laughs> I'm like, mom, I cut off my finger. I'm going to the hospital. She's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's funny. That's good. <laughs> Mom, I got to drive soon. I only got one hand. I'm going to have to hang up. I'm going to be at the hospital. So then she kind of realized things were serious. I hung up. They got to the hospital really quick. <laughs> I was surprised. Sure they did. You know, at that point, I was a little frazzled, obviously. Right. And I forget that Denver does not have cell phone service. So I call her and I say, hey, kind of cut myself. Not that bad. Just need a couple stitches. No big deal. Because like, she's four hours away. I don't want right, to worry right, her. Right. Well, later she... She gets that message, and she can't get me. This is probably in the afternoon or maybe in the evening. So she calls my brother. My brother says, oh, man, Ward cut his fingers off. It's bad. I don't <laughs> want her to freak out. You know, that's the whole reason I told her, just a couple stitches. Brothers. <clears throat> but at the same time, my brother, I told him when he got there to the hospital, I gave him my car keys, and I said, here are my car keys. I started out in my shop. I walked up the stairs into my bedroom, into the kitchen, out the door. Trace that path. Clean up any blood. Since Jennifer's coming home, I don't want her seeing my blood all over the house. Surprisingly enough, there wasn't that much blood. Now, my clothes, because once I got in my car and I held it to my chest, my clothes were soaked in blood. And actually, when I got to the hospital, they, all, they asked me, this sweatshirt, we could try to pull it off your hand or we can just cut it. I'm like, well, I really like this sweatshirt, but let's let's just cut it. <laughs> let's not go anywhere near the hand. <laughs> but man, I like that sweatshirt. <laughs> Crazy day. And after surgery, they put me to sleep or on the ambulance on the way to Greensboro. I'm asking like the technician back there, I'm like, well, if they ask me to put to sleep, should I go to sleep or should I try to stay awake? And they said, well, you know, if they give the choice, just let them put you to sleep. It's going to be a long surgery. So they didn't even give me the option. They just put me to sleep. They put that mask on, I count to three, and I'm like, one, two, done. Gone. (laughs) I've had that so many times. Uh, Only one time did I have a really hard time sleeping. but That was my one and only time. But I wake up. It was like instant. Like I felt like no time had passed from one, two to when I wake up. So I wake up. And also, I feel like these hands on my shoulders holding me down, and I can't open my eyes. And at that instance, I don't realize that I just had surgery. I don't, I've forgotten all the day. Right. And it was like, just stay still. I'm like, I don't recognize his voice. Then you know, it slowly dawns on me where I am, and they put some kind of something over my eyes, I guess, 
I don't know what, and they had to wipe that off. So then I was, you know, able to open my eyes and the doctor's like, you know, surgery took two hours. Uh, as I was cleaning up your hand, because he's like, pretty much way to put it through a car washer. There's a lot of debris in there, bone chips and stuff. And yeah. he's like, you know, I figured I was going to amputate your ring finger, but I figured, hey, you know what? I'm just going to try something. We'll see how that works. I'm like, what'd you do? He's like, well, I attached your middle finger to your ring finger. Now you have a really long ring finger. I think it looks cool. <laughs> But he said, we well, you know when I was looking at it, you know, if you kind of rotate it slightly, it kind of fits. <laughs> okay. That's what you want to do. That was Friday. I was in the hospital Saturday. I finally got out Sunday, but they given me, I guess, morphine. Is that the pretty strong? Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, we're going to give you this. You're probably going to go on some kind of magic carpet ride, which never happened. What? I, I never felt funny, never tripped, never anything. Just, wow. but you know, they said, Hey, your pain, medica- pain medication ends at this time. So I thought, okay, I have to wait that long. So they have a little scale in your room about yeah, pain, yeah. one to ten. One to ten. Make- I, I got up to an eight. Oh. Eight is me writhing around on the bed, uh, unable to speak, and you know, tears forming my eyes. Oh, yeah. Eight's been fun. There. Been there. So, I've, been, I've been to nine or ten. So the nurse comes in and is, what's wrong? Well, and I tell her I'm waiting for that pain medication. She says, oh, well, you know, I can just give you a different kind of medication. Why didn't you tell me that earlier? I could have used that a while ago. <laughs> I'm in an eight right now, lady. I'd like to be in a one. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I got to I got to see the full gamut of the you know that little chart makes perfect sense to me now. Yeah. So can you do you have any feeling in the in your fingertips? Well, if you notice, you see how this finger kind of yeah dips? yeah uh huh. That's because that. they didn't quite tighten up the tendon enough. Right. The doctor's like, oh, you just need to do physical therapy. No, he just didn't do the tendon enough. But I don't care. You just happy to have without the him. Still there. I wouldn't have anything there. Right. I have feeling in all of them because the pinky. It just nicked the nicked right. the skin. This finger, I nicked the bone. This finger, see how it kind of dips in? Yep. I went halfway through the bone, ring finger all the way through. So the ring finger is the only one that has any kind of numbness to the tip of it. My fingernail is all screwed up because I cut right through the nail bed. So it's all scrambled. So I actually have two separate fingernails on that finger now because it's just it's all scrambled. But I had to go through physical therapy for six months. You know, I got a bunch of stitches. I actually had pins in three of the fingers. The one in the ring finger was actually internal because it was going to be in there for so long. The other two, were, uh, they poked out the t- tip, which my son loved because he's like, you're Wolverine. That's awesome. <laughs> that's something. <laughs> that is, that's something, son. Go play. And so when I began to think about, well, how is he going to get those pins out? That kind of concerned me. Of course. He took a pair of pliers and he pulled and I didn't feel a thing. Were they craftsmen? I don't know. <laughs> no, they're actually little medical pliers. I'm like, hey. Can I have the pliers? Because you know, I'm thinking maybe those pins and the pliers are putting a little frame, you know, like hang up on the wall. <laughs> He's like, no, I can't give those out. They're a biological hazard. He was just going to throw the pliers away? They were a biohazard or something, like he said. But I wanted them. He wouldn't give them to me. I get, uh, yeah, I've got my son's stitches from his head, those staples. I figured, you know, his first, his first staples in his head. Well, let's take those. Know. Let's get those. Let's frame those up. <laughs> uh, let me back up, though. So from the hospital, they wrapped me from my elbow all the way up. A huge bandage. I remember it. I liked it when it was really big because people knew something really bad happened to me. <laughs> and so when they'd say, what happened to you? Table saw. <laughs> so then later when they, I think like two or three weeks later, they unwrapped it and it was a very small bandage just at my hand. Well, I didn't like that because it looked so small. I was like, oh, what happened to you? Did you get a paper cut or something? <laughs> yeah, it's just such a small bandage. So the pins. So the ring finger, the pin was completely it, internal. But mm-hmm. you could kind of see it sticking out of the end. So I wondered, how is he going to do that one? Because that's... <laughs> And what he did, he just grabbed the pin through the skin and pulled, and I didn't feel anything, which uh, I was happy about. But I have all the pins. You didn't frame them up? I never framed them up. You know, I'm like, without the pliers, you know, the pliers are kind of the centerpiece. <laughs> I'm like, Doc, you messed me up on that. Could have had something. You got to put that somewhere. You got to put it on the table saw. Work the, you shellac them into the table saw. Never forget. I think like a couple weeks after the accident, you sent me a text message of... I think I waited. Was it a couple weeks? It was a couple weeks. Okay. But I thought it was hilarious. And actually, I took... That hand, because the hand is somebody's hand and the ring finger is cut off at the nub. Right, at the knuckle, yeah. I took it, I photoshopped it, and to a little band, it says, Woodworking Hobbyist United. And then the bottom <laughs> says, I cut above the rest. And I hung it up at my desk at work. <laughs> oh, I only missed one day of work. I did it on a Friday, missed Monday, went back to work Tuesday. That's because you only have 15 days of <laughs> but not, you know, like, PTO. My work called me, and they were talking about you know short-term disability and all these things, and and like, well, you should just call. I'm like, well, I'm coming back to work. Well, no, you need to call anyway. So I, I call the office. I'm like, yeah, my boss told me to call about short-term disability. I'm like, well, how long are you be out of work? I'm back to work. What'd you do? I cut a finger off. And you're back to work? <laughs> yeah, I only missed a day. Uh, they cut off a toe and put it on there. It's fine now. That's great. 
Oh my gosh. Well, man, that is a heck of a saga. Gosh, I can't even, I've been injured a lot, but I've never seen, I've never seen bone cut. I technically have never seen it. I don't know how you resisted not taking a picture of it. Uh, you know, that's one of the things. After it was all done and sewn up, the nurse is like, oh, you know what? I should have gotten your phone to take a picture. I'm like, oh, man, why yeah. didn't you tell me that earlier? Yeah, see, that's it's not the first thing I think of when the kids get hurt. You know, I'll, I'll comfort them first, but then right after, I want a picture of, of whatever's bleeding. Or So I've got a lot of pictures of home at, you know, on my computer of, of kids injured. Bloody faces, black eyes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, now, of course, I think, man, that would have been such a good vlog. Oh, gosh, yeah. But I do have a lot of pictures after after everything right. happened. I got a ton of pictures of pins and pulling the pins out. and <sighs> Because every time I'd go, because the ring finger is the worst, but every time I'd go to the physical therapy, they'd pull the scab off. Every time it'd bleed all over the place. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, my daughter. And actually, they, when they took the stitches out, it was all the fingers were so scabbed up that as the scab came coming off, I noticed they had left some stitches in. So I got to pull those out. Oh. And actually, my ring finger... Like I find this like big scab, but it it's not like a scab. And I'm like, well, it can't be bone. And I realize it's just a chunk of fingernail embedded in there that uh, I got to pull out. Gosh, like, wow, that's, that's like gross. four weeks later. That's crazy. Look at that. It's it's a piece of the wood. <laughs> but you know, I will say that when they told me that three of my fingers gonna be amputated, it's kind of a shock. You're like, well, that's gonna that's gonna cause a few problems. I don't imagine it would have caused problems, but geez, you I'm kind of attached to those things. Yeah. You know, yeah. I quickly acclimated myself with that and. You know, I, I resigned myself to what it is, what it is. The hard part was that the ring finger, the doctor is like, well, I don't know if the bones are going to fuse together. Right. And so I met the doctor every week afterwards. He's like, well, we're still not sure. We still might be amputated. You know, so I'm like. Where would they have amputated it? At the knuckle or all it, the way down? Right here. Oh, they would have just amputated yeah. like a third of it off. From this part here, this is where the funky joint is. It's right. kind of twisted. Yeah, yeah. So they would just. I assume got in a grinder, smoothed up the bone, and I, I don't know how this works. <laughs> Get the 2,000 grit. So, you know, that was the hard part is that when they first told me the hospital was going to lose it, okay, and that's the way it is, I can accept that. But then on the other one, I just waited. And even after six months, when he finally released me, he never said, it's going to be okay. He said, well, maybe so. Yeah. Well, you know, they don't want to. Yeah. So at this point, obviously, it's going to be okay. But right. <laughs> it's hard because I'm like, am I going to lose it? Because it was six weeks. I think his, he first bandaged me up, and they didn't unbandage it until six weeks later. And that was fun because if you don't use your fingers or wrists for six weeks and then wrap it, nothing. It I couldn't move anything. Wow. So that's part of physical therapy that did right. get my strength back. But well, you had that. Well, your muscles atrophy oh, after yeah. a certain amount oh, of time. Yeah. You know. Like my wrists are tiny. But of course, you know, I had six weeks to think about: Am I going to lose that finger? Am I going to keep it? I and mean, yeah. that was harder than the hospital when they tell me I'm going to lose three. So I'm like, well, I've been I've been taking care of it for six weeks. It's like a little puppy. I don't want to get rid of it now. <laughs> I would have been I would have been okay with it at that point. I would have just been happy not to lose the third. Oh yeah. So well, if they, cut off, if they cut off a third of one, I would have been okay with that. You know, people are like, oh, are you going to lose it? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, oh, that's terrible. I'm like, well, you know what? If I'm going to lose one, I'd rather it be the ring finger. You don't want to lose the pinky. That, that looks good. The ring finger blends in. If you're going to lose one, lose the ring finger. So have you used a table saw since? My wife said that I couldn't use a table saw, you know, until I was released by the doctor, which was six months. And there was a few times, I think month five, I really wanted to cut something. I'm like, come on, Jennifer, let me use the table saw. And of course she said, no way. So the thing... When I finally went back to it, I went back to cutting my mantle that you know, I hadn't finished before. <laughs> I guess the word is emotional. It's just of course an emotional moment to cut it back on, hear it spinning, and, and put a board through there. I think the last time it was on, you... it got me. So you know, I can honestly say that my mantle upstairs has my blood, sweat, and tears in it. Yeah, literally. Well, I mean, are you scared of it when it comes on? Now, no. But the when first you first few put it on, oh, yeah, that first yeah. time, and that was like you I'm know, sure just you the adrenaline flowing and it's... away from the uh, the blade. Oh yeah. I, I built some push sticks and guards and things to where it keep my hands away from it's that. four feet long. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. But you know, now I use it and it doesn't really bother me. But at the same time, it's nice having a bandsaw because a bandsaw is not as apt to cut through all your fingers like a table saw. Thing, uh, yeah, I think you could easily still lose a finger. Well, see, the the, I mean, you easily could, but table saw is spinning, kind of pulls you into it. The table saw is spinning a different way. So it doesn't really pull you into right. it. Right. Mm. Pretty much a table saw, once you get started, it pulls you in. The bandsaw is not quite as bad at that. Oh, okay. So that's been our shops and how we use our tools <laughs> podcast. Oh my gosh. I, I can't even imagine. But you know, I will link you to my blog because I don't know how long after, but once everything's kind of done, I wrote up a whole story about what happened, x-ray pictures, pictures of my fingers and, you know, everything. So it's uh, it's pretty in-depth and it's cathartic to write it. 
I'm sure of that. Yeah, I like that one. Well, hands down, my first one, I think it's pretty obvious when I cut my hand with the table saw. Of course. So that's that's one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a really good one I had was um, I was riding my bike and somehow, you know, you know, I was young, so I tinkered my bike, you know, like taking it apart, putting it together. Right, yeah, it did That's my thing. prequel to automotive. And so somehow I messed them up, so the chain popped off, locked, and just sent me. It happened so fast that I was holding on, and I was down before I knew it. Landed on my elbow, scratched it from here all the way up. I guess momentum I turned or something. So I also scratched my shoulder and my hip because I had a gravel driveway. Uh. I mean, you got to have a gravel driveway. And so it used to be I had, like, two really cool gashes. It gets better. A week later, I'm, like, trimming hedges or something. And I see one about to fall, so I put my arms up. Hits me right there, oh. right on the scab. So like it had another gash. That was oh. a lot of fun. Yeah, I have a scar on my shoulder, hip, and on my elbow from all that. Fun times. So is that that we're just gonna count that as three? <laughs> nah, I've got a better one. This one's really cool. I've got this scar on my knee that is like six inches long. But when I did it, I was so young, it was only like half an inch long. When I was four, I cut my knee on a piece of tin, like that big. But as I grew, the scar grew. So it's like. It's huge now. Man, I didn't realize the scar would grow. Yeah, I've got one on my knee. I I don't know if it's my worst injury, but I fell out of a car, a moving car, doing Just about 60. Out. Yeah, I was leaning against the door, and the door wasn't all the way shut. Well, I mean, why were you leaning against the door? I was tired. Oh, uh, so you're just driving and sleeping. Yeah, we'd gone to a we'd gone to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is a huge car event. Oh, yeah, yeah. Huge. Carlisle. Yeah, so we were in my dad's Nova, like halfway through the day. It, it was cold when we when we left. Halfway through the day, it warmed up. So I went into the car to go get changed, took my pants off, put some shorts on. The car door was really close to like a pole or something. And I closed it a little bit. And then I went out my dad's door after I got changed. So we started driving. I started to fall asleep. The more I leaned against the door, the more pressure you put on, it just opened. We're on a 12-lane highway. And I fall out of the car. How old were you? I was six or seven. Holy somewhere cow. in there. Fall out of the car, roll across the highway, hit the curb. Almost get hit by a truck. I mean, my knees were tore up. My just arms your knees? Were tore, no, I mean, my that'd arms be all and, of you. No, it's mostly my knees and, and elbows. Because I guess I had rolled, you know. I'd, a little fetal position and, going on. Yeah, pretty much. And I've never seen anything look like that still. I mean, that's gnarly road rash. That's, that was, that was. Oh, just, wow. It had to be doing 60. Break I mean, anything? Fell out of the car. Need any stitches? Didn't break or? anything. No, but I have some really big scars. Oh, you'd have to. Yeah. Probably should have taken me. This is my dad. My mom's not home. We get home. Put some duct tape on it. Dad's like, go get in the bath. (laughs) Get in the bath. Because there's so much blood on me. Just go get in the bath. So he comes up and he's like, I got to do this. What? He's like, I got to clean the the wounds. Uh So he grabs like a little scrub brush and starts scrubbing in each wound. And and it's all down my knees, the Uh wounds. And I still have scars on my knees like this big from where it's hit. That was a bad one. I've broken a couple bones. I've broken fingers. I've broken ankles. I've, how? I mean, any funny uh, stories on how you did that? First time I broke my ankle was my 12th <laughs> birthday. It was a camp. Just to think about it, it's it's so painful. I got my foot stuck between two rocks. We were running, chasing, playing like tag or something. Got it stuck between two very large rocks and then turned really oh. quickly. And it mm. just snapped. It was clean. I didn't even know I broke it. So I pulled it out of the rock and I start uh. to go to run again and fall instantly because uh. it's such a clean break that I didn't even know it was broken. You know my first broken bone? Yeah. I'll tell you my first three. My hand. <laughs> Those are your first broken first bones? Broken bones. Wow. I got pretty lucky growing up. I don't know how I managed to not break anything. I broke an ankle playing hockey. I got slashed really double handed slashed. Same ankle or different ankle? Different ankle. The other ankle. Slashed really hard, double handed. I mean, whipped it around real hard and it just mm. broke my ankle. Broke a finger playing football. I got it stuck in someone's face mask and he fell. Your finger didn't fall with him. I can't remember what middle finger it is. It's so long ago, but they're both pretty bent. <laughs> <laughs> this was a bad one. Same thing. I used to mess with my bike a lot because it was your prequel to a car. I wanted like a really good bike. So I had a GT. I'm tinkering with it, the, the sprocket with the chain, and I just tightened the wheel back, and I was spinning it around to check it, and I don't know, I must have reached up to do something, but I got it caught uh, in in the big sprocket in between the chain, and I pulled it out real quick, oh. and it ripped all the nail off uh. of the thing, and it was totally our visit. I've had stitches in my head from being hit with a railroad spike. I don't remember the next couple hours after it hit me. So that's way more than three, so <laughs> you pick three from there, people. I'll share one. I'll have to check my brother if he wants me to share this. And he'd been out riding the four-wheeler. And he'd been gone long enough to where we're kind of thinking he should have been back by now. Right. You know, where is he? I, I see him walking, and his face looks kind of orange. I'm like, what's going on? And I see him, and it's, it's just blood all over his face. And even though his lips are closed, I can see his teeth because he split his lip open. Oh. 
you know, we didn't wear helmets as much as we should. Right, yeah. And he'd been riding down this mountain, and the thing began to slide. It slid into a ditch. Front hand him right in the mouth. Oh. It chipped all four of his front teeth and pushed them up in the gum. And he'd had braces. He's going to like get his braces off the next week. Oh. He had to wear them for a year later. And he split his lip open all the way. My mom or dad takes him to the ER. They're like, you need to go back and look for his teeth. So I was picking up chips of teeth with like the braces stuck on them. Oh, him. no way. The rest of the summer, I got to make him mashed potatoes for every meal. <laughs> now I'm the best at making mashed potatoes. Yeah. Whew, so that wraps it up for the top three injuries. Thanks for listening to Fridays on the Fly. I'm Eric. And I'm Ward. Check out our website, FridaysOnTheFly.com. You can find our show notes. You can find links to iTunes, Stitcher, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, Instagram. There may be more, but check us out. Please rate, review us, and... Yeah, let us know on iTunes. We want to know what you think. And you can contact us on our webpage. We'd like to know what you think. And share your own injuries. We'd love to cringe at your injuries. We also have a Hotmail account and some MySpace, too. I mean, just for the people that don't, (laughs) that haven't updated. Everybody's included here. (laughs) 